Uh, I think, paucity of time, we move on to uh, the next session. Uh, so it's again very exciting, you know, the valve interventions. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Kapoor, for inviting me for this uh, talk. Uh, this is actually, uh, I don't know uh, how much it will be important for the early uh, audience because uh, this is quite complicated. All Tevas are not this complicated. But I choose this case in most of my conferences because uh, this case gives maximum learning to the audience. And so I try to present uh, this case uh, as much as possible in different places. So this was a 84 years old female, a lot of comorbidities, and a Euro score of 15.08, uh, STS of 6.39, function class 3 dyspnea on exertion, severe AS with gradient of uh, 137 uh, by 78, biotic valve area of 0 0.4 centimeter square, severe calcification over the valve, moderate AR, moderate MR, and good LV function. Angiography, normal coronaries, again, we, on aortography, there was mild to moderate aortic regurgitation, Dr. and Chandra, the aortic please. annulus uh, su was suitable for TAVI. Peripheral angiography, both the femorals were good in size. I always uh, like to take uh, the aortography and the peripherals at the setting of my angiography. This will give me an idea whether the valve is appropriate for the turvy or not. And then after that, we do the echocardiography and MSCT planning. On MSCT planning, you can see that the perimeter was, uh, uh, was 72.4 and uh, the annulus diameter was 22.8, and sinus of SLV was appropriate for doing a TAVA. There was heavy calcification over the valve, and the implanter angle was LAO 17, cranial uh, caudal 7. The problem was this torticity and this turn over the aorta. Also, you can see, if you want to do a TAVA, you should be very clear where you want to take your puncture. If you take a puncture over here for your proglide, your proglide is not going to stay because there is a heavy calcification at that point. So we chose the left side for this one. We required a long seat uh, to take over the, uh, to deal with the severe toxicity present and initial uh, Autography was done. You can see there is at least mild to moderate aortic regurgitation. AL1 catheter and a straight wire we cross the aortic valve and then did the initial assessment. You can see the patient has a severe aortic regurgitation. At the same time, you can also make out that uh, there is hardly any difference between the two and uh, two diastolic pressure. So in a way, if you see out, uh, the regurgitant index is not so high at the beginning itself. So uh, straight amplas super stiff wire was put in the ventricle and the initial pre-dilatation was done with the 22, uh, with the 18 millimeter nucleus balloon. Good dilatation was obtained, but however, when I tried to cross, uh, cross take the valve up, I saw my valve was getting stuck in the, in the ascending aorta right at the point where there was severe uh, calcification and turning. Over here, if I'm going to push the valve then I'm going to produce a severe aortic dissection or aortic, uh, probably aortic rupture. So the trick over here is not to push the valve. Anything pushing in intervention is not good at all. So what I did is I just pulled back, removed it, and then we changed to a Lundquist wire. But despite a Lundquist wire too, I was not able to push the valve, all because of the calcification and also because of two torticity that was present in the aorta. So what we did is, after, after the Lundquist wire, somehow what I did is I pulled back the, the valve and then made the, the spine in align with the aorta by turning my catheter slightly. Doing that, it made flexible in one side and the valve could go through. But again, when I tried to cross the Aortic uh, annulus, I was not able to cross it because of the severe calcification to toxicity again. So what I did is uh, put in another wire, again, M plus Lundquist plus M plus super stiff wire. 
and then try to cross the valve. Despite that, I was not able to cross the valve after a certain point. So what we did is we went for a larger balloon pre-dilatation with a 20 millimeter nucleus balloon. One point about Lundaquist is uh, you should be very careful not to strike too much in the ventricle, otherwise you will, uh, you will end up with a perforation. So you can see here what I do now is actually I don't push through. I just turn my catheter slightly and you can see it just jumps into. So this is what, uh, this is the beginning of, of the Evolute R when it came into the market. Like uh, we are just trying to understand how the catheter uh, behaves actually. This was in 2000, somewhere around 2014. So you can see we soon realized that the spine is very important and that is how we slowly realized all these things. So after that, we removed the, the, removed the Ampla super stiff over the Lundaquist itself, positioned the valve, and soon opened the valve with a, with a good position. Now again, if you see, there are two, two different toxicities. So if I'm not going to align this in center, then I'll pull the valve. So what I do is, I actually pull the wire, and that will co cause the nose cone to come in center, and it just jumps off immediately. So if I don't pull this wire while doing this, you see, I pull the wire slightly, and you can see, okay, okay. Uh, it's just, when I pull the wire, you see, it nose cone comes into the center, and it comes up. So here, it's all tips and tricks. It's nothing like pulling or pushing. And uh, uh, finally, I finish off with an angiogram. There is some mild regurgitation over there, but that is fine. You can also see another thing is that the valve is slightly more deeper into the ventricle. Here, it should be four to six millimeter depth, but somewhere around six to eight millimeter. That is fine. And finally, you can see the hemodynamics, very good hemodynamics. No aortic stenosis, also the uh, end diastolic pressure is very good, regurgitant index was low. The valve area immediately increased from 0 0.18 to 2.63 centimeter square, and this was the trans uh, thoracic on the other day. You can see a very good uh, result of the valve. Heavy calcification so can pose a lot of problem. You should understand how the valve behaves and what is the physiology of the aorta. I'd like to conclude by there. If any question, I'll definitely take the questions. Thank you very much. So I think the main problem was with the wire. You had a problem, I think uh, one problem possibly didn't occur was the loop of the wire which was in the LV was looking very, very narrow. And this kind of a loop, when once you're trying to manipulate, has a tendency to get out of the LV and produce LV perforations. Today we have wires to take care of the perforation in the form of uh, Confida and Safari. But these wires don't give you a curve because most of the wires, as they, as they travel from behind and they come in front, they try to scratch against the entire part of the annulus, as is happening in this case. If mm -hmm. the curve to the wire is more, like, uh, like in coronaries you have, if the stent is not going, you have wires which can give a wiggle. You have a wiggle wire which is, which is described by Paul Tastein from uh, Skips. So he's been, in fact, the only user of this wire in the world. So I think we need to have a wire which has some kind of a wiggle at the aortic valve so that some of the problems in advancing your system, especially once it is striking against the entire part of the annulus, if you just, just have a wiggle, you try to pull the wire a little bit, it tries to direct the valve posteriorly and get off from the calcium. I think the, the companies the have to respond to it. Presently, we don't have anything. This is one of the first uh, Evolute R that was the beginning of the Evolute R. And we had not understood that importance of the spine until then. Yeah. The spine, there is a spine on the catheter, and yeah. that spine, it, the catheter is mobile in only one direction. Yeah. It's not mobile in another direction. So slowly, only we understood over a period of time. Nowadays, Dr. Chandra would agree, the moment we face this kind of problem, we just pull back, we just turn the catheter, and we go forward, and we easily cross through any kind of toxicity, any kind of uh, calcification. Since this was one of the few beginning cases, we, it helped us to understand. That is why I keep on presenting this, that the catheter itself is so flexible that you can go through any place. Yeah, I think you know, that is absolutely right that one of the most uh, important steps is this because 
Sometimes if you push too much, the wire can get, as you were seeing in the between, as uh, he also pointed out that the wire was almost hitting the apex. And especially if the ventricle is small, it becomes a little bit of a problem. So we have to be very careful the, the, and otherwise it can lead the to The second thing I, I didn't tell in this case because of the lack of time. If you see, this ventricle was severely hypertrophied ventricle. Yeah. Yeah. And I was having difficulty in even positioning my wire into the proper pigtail shape. So the first ballooning was done without a proper pigtail. You should never try to do that because while positioning the valve, the proper pigtail is important. And also while pushing the valve, that is important. Somehow we have only understood over a period of time all these things. That's what uh, is more important. It's very well done. Thank you very much. I now invite Dr. Atul Lemieux from Mumbai. Again, one more complex tower. Thank you very much for the invitation. What I wanted to show you is a fairly not as complex tower case as my friend just showed you, so that most of you are not discouraged. Most tower cases are not that complicated. So, I just wanted to show this slide to, sh to show you how popular or how uh, prevalent tower has become around the world. This is Henry Kissinger, Nixon Secretary of State, who said he was getting out of breath more easily and his cardiologist said something had to happen and that something was a tower and he was 92 years old at that time in 2014. So my case is a 75 year old gentleman who presented with worsening dyspnea on exertion he was class three going on to class four. His past medical history was hypertension, hyperlipidemia, heart failure with preserved LV function, remote history of bypass surgery. He was on adequate doses of amlodipine, furosemide, aspirin, and a statin. And his transthoracic echo confirmed severe aortic stenosis with gradients of 70 and 45 with a valve area of 0.75, peak velocity of 4.1 meters per second. His ECG was narrow complex. So as with all tower cases, pre-planning is the most important step to understand uh, a lot of things, the annulus, the peripheral vasculature. And fortunately for us, this gentleman's peripheral vasculature was excellent. He had a minimal diameter of 10 millimeter mercury, 10 millimeters, pardon me, in both left and the right um, femoral arteries. We calculated his STS mortality risk, the Euroscore and logistic Euroscore mortality. And in all these parameters, he fell very discreetly in the intermediate risk zone for surgical AVR. And as you know, the FDA approved the Medtronic core valve and the Evolute R for this intermediate risk category in July of this year. The Sapien 3 and Sapien XT already had an intermediate risk FDA clearance last year based on the Partner 2 and the Partner 2A trial. But the core valve and Evolute got it this year. So our plan for him was a Medtronic Evolute R, 29 millimeter, via the percutaneous femoral approach. This is just a screenshot of his transthoracic uh, gradients. And these are some calculations that, that we did. The mean annulus was 25.7 millimeter with a perimeter of 81.5 millimeter. And he had sufficient heights as far as his ST junction and the coronary ostia were concerned. And this is what it shows you right there. Very nice clearance as far as his coronary ostia are concerned. You might say he had remote bypass surgery so we don't really care so much about the distance of the left main ostium, but I think this is a good exercise just to understand what the anatomy is. And this is just a, th a CTA three-dimensional axis, some tortuos tortuosity, not as much as you saw in the last case, just a standard diving down of the iliacs before they come back up again. 
And these are the screenshots of his right femoral artery and the left femoral. I'm right-handed. I prefer my axis to be in the right femoral artery. And fortunately, his right femoral was about 10 millimeters in size. So we decided to access the right femoral for the valve and the left femoral for the pigtail for check angiograms. And so this is the matrix which helps decide what size valve to place in him. This is proprietary information from Medtronic. And as you can see, this is our patient right here. He's falling right in the 23 to 26 millimeter annulus diameter with a perimeter of about 81. The sinus of Valsalva diameter is, is generous at 36 with a very good sinus of Valsalva height, which is clearly more than 15, giving us a 29 millimeter valve. This is the hardware that we chose, very standard and, and, and straightforward hardware nowadays. What we do is we start with a six fence sheath pre-closed with two per closes proglide at sort of 45 degrees angle to each other. The left femoral artery, we used a seven French sheath for our six French pigtail. This is for our angio checks and also to make sure that the, we have a large gradient uh, confirming severe aortic stenosis. We use the right IJ for a multi-port catheter, which also included a balloon tip temporary wire. And then we slowly upsize our right femoral artery to an 18 French cook sheath. We use the Terimo stiff straight glide wire in an AL1 to cross the aortic valve. Once we have crossed, we exchange it out, put in a pigtail, and on the pigtail we put a Cook Lundequist. We, we, used, we chose a double core curve Lundequist wire. You can also use the Medtronic Confida wire or the Amplite Super Stiff wire as well. We chose this particular double curve wire. It is a four centimeter floppy tip and works very well. We also had some ZMED2 balloons for standby. There is some question about should you pre-dilate and should you not, and when do you pre-dilate and when should you not? We felt in this case, because the aortic valve area was about 0 0.7, 0 0.8, it wasn't really critical aortic stenosis, so we didn't feel the need to really pre-dilate the valve, and most of the times you can get away with not pre-dilating. We chose to use general anesthesia for this case primarily because I wanted to use a 3D TE to get, get a good pictures for you know, adequate implantation. Obviously, you don't need a TE to implant the aortic valve, but it is nice if you have it because you can get a nice TE 3D view from the left ventricular outflow tract looking out, out into the aorta. These are our standard uh, check angios, checking both the right femoral artery and the left femoral artery, making sure that our sheets are okay. This is just standard implantation. What you're seeing here up top is our TE probe. This is the pigtail which we've put in from the left femoral artery for angio checks. This is the temporary balloon tipped temp wire coming in from the right IJ. This is my double curved Lundquist wire, and this is the delivery system with the Evolute R coming down. Fairly straightforward, coming down nicely. And we started off with making sure that the valve is about that four to five millimeters just below the aortic annulus to start unsheathing this. And we are pacing. You don't need to pace with the Medtronic core valve. You don't need to pace very fast. You can maybe pace at 120, 130. With Sapien, it is much more important to pace at a much higher rate. So here we are pacing at about 130. Patient is tolerating it very, very well. And what you saw in the last slide was frequent angio checks through the pigtail catheter. And then the valve was deployed. I'll show you some transthoracic images very quickly. And after the valve gets deployed, this is standard. We make sure that we haven't damaged anything on our way up. So take some standard pictures, one pigtail from the left side at the bifurcation, making sure everything is okay. And these are some transthoracic pictures that I'll go through very quickly. I know my time is up. This is the trans, trans esophageal TE that we are doing just before implantation. You can see severe aortic stenosis. This is just after implantation. You can see that, that there's nice laminar flow here, no flow acceleration in the LV outflow tract, and very mild mitral regurgitation. We also make sure that the intermitral aortic curtain is intact, that it is not impinging on the mitral valve, 
and there is adequate opening of the mitral valve. 48 hours later, we did another 2D echo. And what you see here is nice clean pictures. This is a parasternal long axis. Mitral valve is opening very nicely and there is laminar flow in the LV outflow tag going into the aorta. So fairly straightforward uh, 29 millimeter Revolute R Medtronic valve. Thank you, I'm happy to answer any questions. If there are no questions, the, I don't think the, the presentation itself was very lucid and uh, relatively simplified. I think, uh, uh, I, just is had, there a I just had one quick question I wanted to ask an opinion from the sure, panel sure. and others. There is a practice of putting down a, uh, a point 035 wire from the left, let's say you're using the right femoral artery. There is a practice of putting crossing a 035 over to the wire yeah, crossing, crossing over and eye. keeping a safety. Are many people using that or have many people become so comfortable now that you don't feel the need for that safety wire in the access? Well, the safety wire, uh, it, it can also help you in a way that uh, many times when you're trying to puncture the vessel, it is always nice to puncture right on the top of the vessel, especially when you're, once you're trying to put, you're trying to supposedly put two proglides at maybe 210 position and that 210 position may not be exactly 210. So to puncture the vessel right on the vault, if you have the uh, anatomy there, which uh, I think uh, Grobe does it regularly, he crosses over to the other side. In fact, he uh, at times puts a pigtail there, which becomes a reference right in the center of the pigtail, then you can puncture it. So I think uh, uh, people can put it even, even a pigtail. And having a safety bar on the other side is not a big step, especially to at times uh, handle a catastrophe. I, I don't think it, it doesn't really come in the way of the procedure. What is your take on Chandra? Yeah, um, as far as this wire, you mean to say that you keep the wire during the entire procedure? During the entire procedure, you sleep. Okay, no, I don't think that is so much required because, uh, you know, we don't put, keep any wires there because you have the access all at all times. So once you are finishing your access, that is the time you can put a wire, otherwise it's not so much required. No, at times, I'm sorry, at times if the bifurcation of aorta is acute, it may not be very easy to cross over from one, from one to the other side. Uh, see, as far as problem of the wire is concerned, the problem may be usually near the groin. So you can park it maybe higher up in the, in the bifurcation. From there it can be easy to slip it down. Because okay. like, like sometime when we started PCI, if I go back 25 years ago, it used to be a good practice to park the uh, temporarily just in case you are anticipating it, it will be required. Let's say you're doing a rota on RCA and you might possibly require a temporary wire. So it is good practice to go from IVC into RA once. Th th this will rule out, sometime you have an anomalous or an interrupted IVC and then you are struggling around. So it, it may not be a bad thing to just get over, do a Reiki, so that just in case there is a problem, you are ready. Yeah, you can pass a thinner wire, but yes. Uh, Yeah, 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 absolutely right, absolutely right, yes. Great, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. So, may, may I know, because I have Dr. Chandra also here, so I think uh, I'll request Dr. Chandra to start his presentation. There is this expanding indications from high risk now to intermediate risk. I think this is a very exciting topic because uh, anything uh, which the cardiologist uh, starts has to start in only high risk. He is not allowed to do anything in the intermediate low risk and after having proven things in high risk, then gradually, we have uh, faced all these things from, from the mitral area and then, so yeah, <laughs> and uh, already I think. No, but in angioplasty Ted, we started with simple Already Ted, Ted Feldman has already presented that uh, Tavar has already surpassed Sever as far as uh, isolated uh, aortic valve replacement discounts and that means in uh, now in, in the world if you have to do only aortic valve replacement and nothing else in addition to that that means you don't have to replace mitral or do mitral repair or something else then uh, uh, handling of aortic valve now is being done 
मोर एंड मोर बाय ए कार्डियोलॉजिस्ट एंड दी नंबर ऑफ इम्प्लांट्स बाय कार्डियोलॉजिस्ट इज ऑलरेडी एक्सीडेड वॉट इज बींग इम्प्लांटेड बाई द सर्जनस एंड इफ इट इज अलाउड फॉर मे बी इंटरमीडिएट एंड लो रिस्क गॉड नोस फॉर मोर सो गुड आफ्टरनून ऑल ऑफ यू आई एम श्योर वी हैव डिस्कस्ड अ कपल ऑफ केसेज नाउ वी हैव सम फ्लेवर ऑफ द टैवी सिचुएशन इन इंडिया so i will give you a brief overview of uh, what exactly is the status now for trans tavi is trans catheter aortic valve implantation for treatment of aortic valve stenosis and as you know aortic valve stenosis in elderly more than 65 years of age is something like this and mainly it is a degenerative disease which we are actually discussing today we are not uh, actually discussing the treatment of rheumatic heart disease leading to aortic stenosis because that presents at a younger age and it is associated with other valve disease as well so the problem we thought that probably in india we won't have so many cases but this is a data which was presented by dr manjunath in indian heart journal and it shows that the about one third of the valvular heart disease is aortic stenosis compared to what we used to think earlier that in only mitral valve is the predominant disease which is so in the young patients but in advanced age aortic stenosis becomes a more significant problem and degenerative disease is the most common cause of aortic stenosis in patients beyond the age of 65 70 years of age and here you can see that this is the number of patients who are existing in our country who need to be treated now why do we treat these patients we we all know we have gone through these uh, Uh, you know uh, diagrams so many times that as soon as the symptoms start the longevity or the survival rate is very very low 50% at 2 years so we have to treat them somehow or the other but the problem is look at this we think that probably it is not such a serious problem but if you compare it with the cancers which are common disease at that particular age you see that the prognosis with severe inoperable aortic stenosis is worse compared to any kind of cancer Uh, at this particular age so it is a serious problem it needs to be treated now the treatment option for such patients of aortic stenosis who have degenerative severe aortic stenosis at this particular age is valve replacement now whether it is a mechanical valve or a tissue valve the valve has to be treated surgically but the the real situation in life is that about half of these patients are not able to be get treated by surgery so what to do in these kind of situations the answer is this as you saw in previous cases these are the kind of valves which are being used for trans catheter aortic valve implantation these are balloon expandable valves the sapien series of valves and the above is the self expanding valves the core valve and the evolutor so this is the option and this option let me tell you has been now labeled as one of the most exciting innovation in the last 10 years in the field of medicine Uh, uh, apart from other innovations like facebook youtube etc which has impacted our life so much so now what is the evidence why should we use this and where should we use this now this is the summary of what we have in terms of the evidence so we started with as dr trehan said we started with extreme patients the most sickest of the patients which is good for us because in angioplasty we started with the most simple cases the most simple lesions were treated initially and then we gradually built upon that but here we treated the most inoperable serious sick patients and there we showed that tavr is better than medical therapy because they were not getting any treatment so it showed that yes tavr should be done in these patients then when we got success in these sub group of patients we said okay high risk patients can be taken and then again it was compared with surgical aortic valve replacement showed that yes this therapy works in these patients and with the success of that it was then taken to intermediate risk patients in these two trials the partner 2 and sertavi trial which is the pivotal trial for intermediate risk patient again showed that it is a good technology works very well and then now trials are on for low risk patients and you will see that this is the trend which has emerged after these trials in various countries where this technology is available for long time <coughs> now this shows that tavr has surpassed the number of surgical valve replacements in germany in from 2008 to 2015 data it shows very clearly and in us also the same trend is emerging from the tvt registry 
which is the most, the, the best, you know, data which is available right now. And here you see that it has surpassed the results of surgery. But interestingly, you will see that surgery has not come down. So who are these patients? These are the patients who were actually left untreated, most of them, and now they are being treated by transcatheterotic valve implantation. So it has not replaced surgery. It is in addition at this point in time and being used to those patients where surgery cannot be done or they don't want to get it done. So these are the number of patients who are randomized in the trials, about 6,000 patients. And these are the data which has been published. Based on that, we are using TAVR today in, medic uh, in patients who are extreme risk, in patients who are high surgical risk. In these two trials, partner VNA and US core valve pivotal trial. And then in intermediate risk patients from the SIRTAVI and the partner to a data established that yes, this therapy can be used in these two, three subset of patients. Now, most of these patients are being done through transfemoral route compared to transepical route now. And it, with, with transfemoral route, it favors TAVR in this subgroup of patients from the meta analysis. And this is the intermediate risk group where it again showed that TAVR is favorable to be used through transfemoral access in these patients. But TAVR is not all hunky-dory. There are some problems which were noticed. And so we have to compare these complications also with the complications of surgical valve replacement. Now look at the kidney injury. How much kidney injury happens? Kidney injury happens more with surgical valve replacement. Atrial fibrillation happens more with surgical valve replacement. And major bleeding complication also happens more with surgical valve replacement, but it also happens with TAVI. But it is lesser than the surgical replacement. So it scores over surgery in this subgroup of patients. But where it doesn't score above surgery is this. Paravalvular aortic regurgitation is still noticeable in many patients. And here you see if you compare with surgical valve replacement, TAVI is inferior to surgical valve replacement in this uh, situation and also permanent pacemaker implantation is more with transcatheter aortic valve implantation compared to surgical aortic valve implantation. However, most of us believe that it is not actually a complication, it is a sequelae of what we do in these patients. Then the question is how long these valves will survive? So these, lungs ha these valves have been seen that their hemodynamics is maintained up to five years, three years in core valve and five years in partner 1A trial and they remain consistently good compared to surgical valve replacement as you see in these charts. So based on this, this uh, therapy has been uh, approved in uh, many countries including United States and also in India, DCGI approved this technology in 2016 for patients who are in this mean age group. So we have to remember that this therapy presently is limited to elderly patients or those patients who are lesser than 75 years of age where surgery cannot be done at all. So that is the situation right now. And with this, the trends are moving towards lower surgical risk patients in, uh, in many countries, including uh, UK. So what has happened now? That this is the guidelines, which shows that you can use it in extreme risk, high risk, increased risk, and now we are moving even towards low risk patients. And based on all this data, you know, everywhere there was a huge uh, hurry to present this, I mean, to give this information in BMJ. There was a rapid, uh, you know, uh, uh, publication about the indications of doing TAVI in patients with severe symptomatic aortic stenosis. And this is a class one indication if a heart valve team or a heart team is available, both the cardiologist and the cardiac surgeons are on site with a collaboration between the two, which is known as heart team, these heart valve implantations can be done. And the limitations, as I said, apart from pacemakers and paravalvular leaks, stroke is another problem which, can, which is still existent. And we are looking at that. Various studies are being done to prevent stroke by using uh, protection devices, then vascular complications, and long-term durability of the valves beyond five years is still unknown. So that is something which we'll have to see over years, and then only we'll be able to comment on that. So I think this is the situation. These are some new generation transcatheter valves. And the future of TAVI is this now, that we are moving towards lower risk and younger patients, moderate aortic stenosis with heart failure, and severe asymptomatic aortic stenosis is also being addressed in this trial, which is early TAVR trial, and struck in specific anatomic conditions like a bicuspid aortic valve disease, 
pure native aortic regurgitation, it is still not recommended, and failed surgical bioprosthesis where it is now being recommended. So this is a work in progress where this valve is being tried. So uh, with this, uh, I think with the initial uh, issues, with initial problems, now after 10 years, TAVR has emerged as a powerful therapy in most patients with aortic stenosis. And with this, we have moved forward. We have done a, uh, you know, a significant number of cases now in India, but not too many. It is about 250 or 260 cases. So I'll quickly move on to some you know, data which we have. I think it is about 260 cases which we have done. And uh, they are all mostly doing fine. In our series, we have done about 56 patients. And these patients are absolutely OK. After one week of discharge, none of the patients has had any morbidity or mortalities. And the, the echo data in these patients is very, very good. And uh, let me just share with you that uh, the pacemaker implantation rate also has been extremely low in our series of patients. The follow-up maximum is four years in our series of patients. And all those patients who were discharged, two patients died in the hospital, but all of them who were discharged, they are all doing fine after this uh, valve implantation. And the mean hospital length of stay is about five days in our patients. And uh, these are some of the patients who underwent transcatheter aortic valve implantation this is one of the young patients. He was rejected for surgery in many hospitals. The surgeons actually referred this patient to us, and this is one day after valve implantation. He is doing very well, and we called these patients for a follow-up, and you can see that they are quite active, doing very well. Now, based on this uh, experience, we did recently we did another case, which is a same valve used in mitral position. So this lady had a mitral valve replacement surgery about uh, 10 years back, and this valve, which you can see is a bioprosthetic valve, had degenerated and become stenosed. And she was having a severe mitral stenosis, restenosis again. So we went through a transseptal approach. Here you see the wire, we are dilating the septum. And through this, we took the uh, valve, which is a Sapien S3 valve. You can see here, it is positioned across the uh, previously deployed mitral valve. And here we have expanded it, which is a 26 size valve. And it worked very well. And after that, we closed the, uh, the hole, which is in the atrial septum, through a ASD device, which is, I think, a 12 millimeter device. So this uh, worked quite well. And the lady was discharged. She was 82 year old. And she was discharged in three to four days' time. This is the lady who was uh, treated by uh, this uh, transcatheter mitral valve. So this all looks very interesting, very promising. But the problem is cost. The many people in India cannot afford a 25 lakh procedure, but we have a respite here, and this is the made in India valves are now available. They are in trial right now. They are not commercially available, and we are, many centers are now in, you know, enrolling patients in this study, including ours. We are using Hydra, and it's going to start the MyVal patients, and these valves are also doing very well. So finally, patients more than 70, 75 years of age who are fragile, who have other comorbidities are reasonable candidates for transcatheter aortic valve implantation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chandra. Any comments and or query from the PEN co panelists? Yes, may I have a question? Uh, this anticoagulation uh, post procedure, that, that is my question. What, what happens with the anticoagulation thing? Okay, let me tell you. This. Uh, area of anticoagulation after uh, transcatheter valve replacement is still a little hazy right now because initially what we were doing, 90% uh, of our patients remained on dual antiplatelet therapy for the first three months, aspirin and clopidogrel, and then they are continuing on aspirin and they are doing fine. But about six, eight months back, there was a uh, publication which happened in NEJM and it said that you know, there are uh, some incidences of valve thrombosis very early after transcatheter valve implantation. And based on that, those patients who are high risk and those, people who, those patients who have slightly high gradients soon after implantation, in these patients, we put them on oral anticoagulation for the first three months and then continue aspirin alone for the rest of the time. Actually, the largest work on this field is uh, by Dr. Raj Makkad. I think he started his work about four years ago. And this is nothing different from what happened to the surgical valves. About 10% of the surgical valves in the first week will become heavy. 
the gradients will rise. If you see them on CT, you will find thrombus. Some of them will progress to valve failure. The others won't. Surgeons realize this much, much early. That's why if any patient undergoes a aortic valve replacement with a biprosthetic aortic valve, I think surgeons don't shy away from putting these patients on short-term anticoagulation, usually three months, but sometimes they can extend it for a longer period of time. I think similar kind of thing is going to happen to even tabers because they're no different. Yeah, there is yeah. a study which is uh, Dr. Raj Makkar is doing that. Yeah. He presented it uh, recently as part of that data showing that even NOAX can be used as a starting therapy for the first three to six months along with aspirin and then switch over to aspirin alone. Thank you, Dr. Chanda. Thank you. Thank you. May I now request uh, Dr. Rajneesh Kapoor for again a complex tower case. As a comment to the last question of uh, uh, you know, thrombus appearing in uh, Taver bioprosthetic valve early on. So I think Raj Makkar data is, you know, obviously this is not visible on echo, it's a bioprosthetic. So it's a CT guided study where they found that initially in the first one or two months, there was a dysfunction of one of uh, the leaflets happening. And then they uh, put those patients on antithrombotics, anticoagulants, and found out that after two months of anticoagulation that this function is getting corrected. So the functionality was restored once they put those patients on anticoagulants. So it's still emerging as Dr. Chandra also mentioned, it's a gray zone area. But uh, I think we have to have more data on this to have guidelines that it may be possible that in TAVR also, there may be a guideline of three months anticoagulation post TAVR once we have more data. So uh, that was a wonderful presentation by Dr. Chandra. Obviously, you know, he has done quite many cases. So. Uh, so this is my contribution to a national TAVR scene. I have done few of these. So this was a very high risk patient. I thought I'll share it uh, in the forum. Uh, you know, it's not that it was anatomically very complex, but patient as such, total presentation was very complex. So this was a 69 year old patient who had a, a interior wall MI seven years back. And at that point of time, patient had undergone PTCA stand to LAD and uh, his ejection fraction documented in the previous records once uh, after that uh, event or the angioplasty was 30% ejection fraction and he was having moderate MR. He was relatively doing okay, but for last year or so his symptoms really increased. You know, he had, uh, you know, very distressing class four symptoms for last one year or so. And now the, once he presented to me with the, the echo findings, it was a critical aortic stenosis moderate mitral regurgitation, PA pressures of 75 and ejection fraction of 20%. And with this, obviously with this uh, diagnosis, with this setting, he, he went to many places. And in fact, he was denied surgery at four or five places. Uh, you know, and on top of that, I'll show you the angiogram of this patient. Uh, this is the description of that angiogram. The LED stent was patent. The circumflex was totally occluded and even the right coronary was a critical lesion at the crux. So clearly he was not a surgical candidate and in fact at five or six centers he was denied surgery. Now to add further to the woes, you know he had a bicuspidiotic valve, very calcified bicuspidiotic valve. This is a transesophageal echo. So the challenging points which we were encountering in this patient was uh, LV dysfunction, very bad low ejection fraction of 20%, critical aortic stenosis with bicuspid aortic valve, moderate mitral regurgitation and very high PA pressures. So this is the angiogram. CERC, as I mentioned, was 100% and LED was uh, prior stented about few years back. So uh, this, so this is the LED, there is some 60-70% uh, lesion in the mid territory and this is the right coronary artery. In fact, when once he presented, he was in uh, heart failure, congestive heart failure, bad state. So we took time to decongest the patient initially, uh, almost a week we decongested this patient. Uh, we initially thought that we should fix the RCA first. What happened once he presented with injection fraction of 20%, we got a PET cardiac scan done. And PET, PET cardiac scan showed 
15 to 20 percent hibernation in the RCA territory, not even in the LED territory, which was infected some years later. So initially, our, our point of discussion was, should we fix the right coronary artery in different sitting and then take him up for tower? But obviously, somewhere there was a concern in the mind that once we do the RCA stenting, maybe the patient may get complicated by heart failure again and we lose that opportunity for a tower. So at that point, we thought, let's plan it in the, in the same sitting. So once we planned everything at that point, after a week of decongestion, uh, we started the procedure in the hybrid lab and first took the PA pressures. To our surprise, his, still his systemic pressures were 90 and with uh, PA pressures of 70 to 75 systolic. But no other option. We had done our bit, so uh, that was the only hope this patient had. So we thought, although there is a lot of cost involved, there is a lot of risk involved, so we thought just we'll, we'll go along and keep praying. I had, Frank, uh, huge palpitations while, uh, you know, dealing with this. So initially, first step, right coronary artery, crux plasty, nothing much, uh, eventful in that. So we opened the crux, RCA was looking better. And then started this uh, TAVA uh, from the femoral approach. I don't have that graphic, but to tell you, uh, it was around 25 of annulus. So we selected Evolute R of 29. Uh, so this is the confida wire, aortic valve crossed, confida wire is into the LV and uh, evolute are loaded, checked on fluoroscopy. So this is the picture which tells us some teaching point as Dr. Amit was also mentioning. So initially the BAV was done at rapid pacing. So look at this position of the evolute R. Obviously, it's not looking extremely coaxial. You know, it's not looking very bright. Uh, although the the uh, uh, point leading into the LVOT was okay, but it's not coaxial. So here, a lot of maneuvering had to be done with a lot of counterclockwise rotation to the whole system, and the wire manipulation was also required here. Otherwise, uh, to tell you, you know, we deployed this thrice and took it back. You know, because now normally it is mentioned that three times only it can be done, but we deployed and took it back because it was just going deep inside into the LV. So because of this position, and then this is much better position. So this is another teaching point as, uh, you know, which uh, comes from everybody. That, you know, it, it should look really good coaxiality and the position should be good. So this was a good position which came after a lot of maneuvering the whole system. And then uh, the deployment was very fair and uh, actually it was quite accurate. So this is the deployed valve, this is the autogram and it looks fairly okay. And on T also we checked there was hardly any uh, paravalvular leak, so, so uh, the procedure was done. Uh, as to give you the follow-up, we have the follow-up of this patient for about two months or so, then um, I'm not keeping the track after two months. So patient did relatively okay, I won't say very great. Uh, so he continued to have breathing distress. Now on top of that, he had moderate mitral regurgitation as I mentioned and ejection fraction of 20%. So uh, there was some improvement in the LV function, but his symptoms were not very bright after that. So that also is a question whether when once we are dealing with critical AS and moderate MR with LV dysfunction, how these people would behave, it's a it's, uh, point to be seen. But this was uh, my case and I, uh, it gave me a lot of learning points, so I thought I'll share it with uh, this forum. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rajnish. Did you, uh, by the way, did you check the PA pressure immediately after implanting the… Uh, we, we kept on checking, we kept on doing the… Ac after, after doing in the hybrid cath lab, it was, it came down from 75 to 65. So I think that's a good point uh, because uh, from our experience in handling mitral well, many of the patients will have a PA pressure which may not regress so early. And these are the cases who maybe on long term might show us something different. Maybe, like I think whole depends on the mitre regurgitation. If that improves, I think this guy yeah. has, a, has a good life ahead. No, plus the other thing is that many patients who uh, have low ejection fraction, their LV will still continue to improve. Some patients respond very fast. 
But this patient, we still have to wait. Maybe in three to six months time, his LV will become almost normal. Yes, that maybe. Is maybe. That, that was the whole thing because he had no option. He had no other option than to intervene. Only thing was cost factor. So we discussed with the family that we still don't know that how he's going to behave after Tavar, but this is the cost. So are you ready? Because he, they have gone to many hospitals and uh, uh, had their homework done. Yes. Yeah. In a patient who has severe aortic stenosis, bicuspid aortic valve, previous MIs, non-functional LV, which is with about 20% ejection fraction, and severe MR with, P, with systemic pressures of 90 and a PA pressure of 75, when would you like to offer the patient a one-step therapy like a cardiac transplant? 100%. So these are the candidates actually, uh, you know, well indicated for transplant provided on cath they have a good PVR. So pulmonary vascular resistance should be uh, a 5 or lesser but in case these patients have a high pulmonary vascular resistance again then they are not the good candidates. Yeah, but, but then I, we can find suitable, suitable donors with a suitably evolved RV for those patients. I mean th that is a different matter. My problem is this patient can continue to be in heart failure. He will still be at SCD risk. And he will be dealing and you will never be able to fix that mitral regurgitation. It's a good hope that mitral regurgitation comes down following the aortic valve implantation. But what if it doesn't? What if it was actually an ischemic MR or something which has been caused by a structural damage? I think maybe we have to think whether these patients should be given a transplant option ab initio. No, it's, it's pretty fair. I think we should look at that angle also. But given that critical AS and how the moderate MR would behave in future, we still don't have a real natural history. I think and, and outside what they are doing, they are also taking into account the mitra clips. So one side they are doing the, uh, uh, you know, tower and uh, considering the mitra clips for uh, mitra regurgitations. So that looks even better than uh, only giving a one a one door uh, solution for one problem. If we give solution for two problems, it's always better. But thinking of transplant and first doing the cath data, everything it's, is a good idea. Thank you. So now getting away from the aortic well, let's walk on to the mitral well. May I request Dr. Safil? Mitral valve, uh, uh, I think, Chandra, I would like to say anything, a couple of words before uh, the real talk starts. <laughs> what to say? I think uh, mitral valve is a problem. We face it every day. Uh, severe mitral regurgitation. Native for native valves, I think mitral clip is a good technique, but we don't have it. But fortunately now, since we have done one uh, case and we are heading towards some more cases in mitral valve and valves, uh, which is a very good treatment, with these sapien S3 valves. Good afternoon, respected chairpersons, members on the panel, and uh, audience. Uh, the purpose of my presentation shall be not to go into the technicalities of mitral valve replacement, because, well, that is still a little far away, but rather to sensitize as to what options are available or likely to be available in the near future. If you see our journey in handling valvular heart disease, percutaneously, way back in 2000 with the first inhuman implantation of the uh, Melody Valve, we conquered the pulmonary. Uh, at around the same time, we started working on aortic and mitral valves, and mitral to and aortic today is established. In fact, now all the uh, talks we are having is about its, its expansion, not its establishment. But something went wrong with the mitral, where we are still talking about what, it is, what is its current status. Tricuspid, well, it is possibly a valve that we have chosen to ignore. Till, rec till recently, many believe that it is an unimportant valve and not, and not having it will cause no damage. Anyway, as we shift focus to it, as its importance gets more established, probably we'll, we'll work on it. But why did mitral fall behind? Well, as compared to aortic, the first and very important reason is, reasons are many, the valve position. Seated in the left AV position, now a truly percutaneous transfemoral delivery is a challenge. 
you need a multidimensional, highly curved catheter course. And to begin with, all devices that are available would be, for instance, dedicated mitral devices, even in trial today, are between 26 to 42 French delivery sheets. Taking it across the septum, then you do not just have to deploy the valve, you have to align it, you have to see there's no obstruction. So its approach is difficult. Interestingly, the first inhuman valve, uh, the cardiac, was done through the transfemoral uh, route, through a transeptal puncture. Interestingly, the next two cases that the same operators did were through the transapical approach. So the options we have with regard to the axis are the transapical, which by and large for dedicated mitral valve procedures is the preferred strategy as of date. Transatrial, again requiring your help of a surgeon. The truly transeptal, whose difficulties to an extent I have discussed reaching the AV valve with such large size sheets, and the retrograde aortic. We have these transepical delivery catheters. What you have here on the screen are for intrepid, tiara. I shall be discussing some of these valves in a little detail. The approaches to transeptal delivery we have, the cardiac shoe I discussed, the first one that was done transeptally. Not easy. Now, valve position is one of many challenges. The other is the complex mitral valve anatomy. It is asymmetrical, it is a three-dimensional structure, it is, saddle, it is a saddle-shaped annulus. It does not give you any structure for anchoring. And this, in fact, is, a, is one thing which is, can, is partly taken care of in severely calcified valves or valve-in-valve valve or valve-in-rings, and that is why those are coming up faster than management of native disease. Management of complex disease is coming up faster than that of native disease. And also, the complex subvalvular apparatus, which has to be preserved to avoid any damage to the left ventricle. Also, there are dynamic changes in the mitral annular geometry during each cardiac cycle. There is a change in annular area of up to 30% in different phases of the cycle and annular circumference of up to 50%. You cannot have a device with extreme radial stiffness. You have to balance radial stiffness, which resists the dynamic environment and avoids frame fracture. At the same time, it should not be causing perforation of adjacent structures. And the adjacent structures are many. That is the other problem. It should not obstruct the LV outflow tract. It should not occlude the left circumflex. It should not be compressing the coronary sinus or causing major conduction system disturbances. Also, Mitral disease is not necessarily mitral disease. It may, it may be primary. That again, or a mix of the two. So everything from the valve to the disease is complex. Last but not the least, thrombogenicity. We all know at the mitral position, you're much more likely to encounter this problem than at the aortic. The aortic management still is in the gray zone. Mitral, let us see what happens when these cases come up. Among the, among the challenges you see here in this image, if your valve is well implanted, but if it is not aligned, this would, should have been its direction, this is capable of causing significant LVOT obstruction. In a valve in ring series, about 3.7% significant LVOT obstruction in the population studied. There are ways of predicting it. Gradually, we, uh, whatever studies are going, we are uh, looking at ways to overcome it the septal thickness, the angle at which it is deployed, and many delivery devices are now allowing you, before you finally release your valve, or even till the time of release, to align it again and again. Especially, I'll, mention, I'll discuss the tendine system. So we have challenges, we have many challenges, and we are overcoming them. Here you can see here, a, a transcatheter mitral valve implanted, and an essential step, an angio taken, showing no compromise of the left circumflex. So, coming to what is still offerable, the valve-in-valve -valve or the valve-in-ring procedure at the mitral valve. We have here the relatively less invasive approach in patients who already have a valve-in C2, as we saw just in a presentation prior to this. Our experience in, in, in India, I believe, started in June of this year, where the first case was performed, and now we do have single-digit uh, single cases from different centers. Valve-in-valve, valve-in-ring, 
actually this is making things simpler rather than complex because it is giving you the annulus that you actually lack. A number of transcatheter devices, predominantly meant for the aortic position, have been used in valve involve or valve ring procedures. The Sapien XT, the Melody, the Sapien 3, which we just saw. In June 17, it, re it received USFDA approval for this particular indication. The Innoware, which was implanted, I believe, at a center in Chennai, the first in India, Valve Involve. Direct, dedicated Lotus and Direct Flow are dedicated mitral apparatus. Most of these, which we are comfortable with, are the balloon expandable systems. A hybrid procedure we see here. Procedures are ongoing. The technology is developing. We see a patient with uh, surgically implanted bioprocesses and a percutaneous trans system giving a reasonably good result at the mitral position. Now, coming to the dedicated transmitral system, I will just be running through them because not, none of us, I believe, is implanting it as pre at present, but we are all hopeful that we'll be doing it soon. Just a brief overrun, all these dedicated transmitral valves are self-expanding with nitinol-based frames all have an anchoring based either on axial fixation principle, outward radial force, or a combination of the two. They, tend, they attempt to capture the mitral leaflets and secure the valve to the annulus. Many of these have additional features to address paravalvular leakage. Most manufacturer's designs, as I mentioned, allow fine positioning adjustments and device retrieval before the final stage of deployment. You feel your LVO is getting obstructed, you reposition it. Delivery approaches, as I have discussed, the transapical is what is today the most commonly being used, the most convenient, but really cannot exactly call it truly transcatheter. Delivery sizes, as I said, range from 26 to 42 F. This is the Cardi AQ valve, the first generation, which was implanted in 2012, and with some improvements, the second generation. The Tayara valve, we see the structure here. Not circular, but D-shaped, trying to mimic the mitral annulus and a large atrial flange, which would give it some stability. The tendine, as I said, I discussed in some detail, because of its unique design, it can only be implanted transapically. And what it has here, it has here a tether. Can I get my? Yeah. It has here an apical tether, which you can manipulate to see how well you are aligning your valve so that it does not ca cause LVOT obstruction. We see this tether here before deployment at the, uh, in the echo view. We see this 3D transesophageal uh, view of this apical tether, and we see here a successfully deployed valve. Others include the Medtronic transcatheter mitral system, no inhuman experience. The Voltex cardio valve, which is designed to be implanted using the transfemoral route. Others include the endovalve system. The Gorman device, unique because it is made of a single nitinol wire woven in a 3D frame and takes the mitral shape. We see the angiogram before and release of the device, no LVOT obstruction, no, no significant aortic regurgitation, no compromise of the circumflex. Mitra assists valve involve is not truly a valve, it is more of a valve assist device which allows the own valve to function and basically assists it and reinforces it, reducing leakage. Others include the High Life Transcatheter Mitral Valve System. Just, I am aware my time is up, so I shall just move on to the message as to what relevance this presentation has for today. Well, as of today, tra dedicated transcatheter mitral systems in May till May 2017, 181 have been implanted worldwide. That is extremely limited experience. Maximum with Tendine, followed by Intrepid, Tayara, Cardi AQ, High Life, and Kaison. The implications for this presentation today are, well, yes, science is progressing. We should be aware of it. We should be sensitized to it. Mitra clip is not the only thing that is available for mitral surgery. But most importantly, even for an average physician, not somebody who is doing a valve involve procedure, when you discuss surgical versus, uh, uh, when you discuss a, a patient going for surgical valve replacement, when you discuss with him metallic versus bioprosthetic valve, your biggest fear is that that bioprosthetic is going to degenerate sometime down the line. When multiple factors you take into account while 
taking a joint decision with that patient, have this at the back of your mind, that when that bioprosthetic does degenerate, probably, even in the mitral position, we will be in a position to handle it minimally invasively. Thank you. Let me just uh, uh, try to reiterate the last message we tried to give was that uh, today if you have a patient who is going for a mitral valve replacement, he has two options. To go for a mechanical valve or go to go for a bioprosthetic valve. And often the surgeon will say the bioprosthetic valve will wear off fast, so go for a mechanical valve. But uh, the, usually the, the, even the old time valves used to last about 8 to 10 years and today's uh, bioprosthetic valve, they are at least said to be lasting up to 20, 25 years. So I think, that, I think there is a very strong reason that somebody is going for a mitral valve replacement and unless there is some other factor, if he goes for a bioprosthetic valve, 10 years down the line, valve in valve will be a very, very simple job. And even today if you look at, he presented the largest number of cases is just 180 for the, the dedicated mitral valves. But Vinny Bapat has presented that almost 400 cases have undergone valve in valve, almost 400 cases. And I think uh, even USFD has approved uh, this uh, Edward Sapien valve, June I think a couple of months ago for its use in valve and valve. So I think at least one message can be given that all those people who are going for a mitral valve replacement, there is, there is one more point for going for a bioprosthetic valve and that point is when it fails, he can be handled percutaneously. It was, uh, I think uh, surgeons are very helpful to us. The most of them are now implanting tissue valves. So we are hopeful that in the next 10 years, we'll have a lot of work to be done for these valves. <laughs> because uh, valve and valve therapy, for valve and valve, as you said, that uh, doing a transcatheter for even a mitral or aortic for both positions, it is a, an extremely good uh, methodology to treat through transcatheter. Yeah. It was if, if, you, if you look at the mitral annulus, it is a, a 3D structure. It is one D shape, second it is a 3D hammock like. And today's mitral valve, if you, have to, if you have to implant, you have to handle a 3D structure and put a 2D, 2D endless on that. On the contrary, once the surgeon has done the job, then this 3D is converted to a 2D and you have a reference. And you can hit that reference fluoroscopically very easily. And often it is felt that uh, the rings are as good as, are, as is well. I am sorry, rings, you have as many surgeons and as many rings. Thousands of rings are there. They are of different types. I think if one has to start, it is much better to start with a valve in valve rather than valve in ring. And if at all you have to go for a ring, choose a ring which is complete and which is rigid, which can give you support for a, a implantation. It was a very nice presentation. Let me just add. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but let me tell you, let me tell you, from our experience with CABG, often the clips will be placed at places. <laughs> so, so it will be, it, it's, the cardiologist is always kept guessing. So, uh, Not so much with the mitral valve, but with the tricuspid valve. Yeah. Especially patients, if you have a tricuspid valve ring, target for a valve and ring for severe TR, which many of our patients really suffer a lifetime of misery. And Actually, those are patients, if, if the ring has been placed, you see, mitral valve will never have a perfect interventional solution. But the tricuspid, if there is an adequate ring, will have a reasonable interventional solution. I think uh, it was a very nice presentation, but uh, let me just add about tendon. The problem with the tendon valve is that uh, you have a button-like structure which is still anchored to the valve That's and right. when the LV starts remodeling, uh, what are you supposed to do with the two uh, hanging structure over there? That will be a source of, uh, you know, a kind of uh, uh, embolic source. The second thing is uh, now there is a very good option of intrapid. Intrapid, you saw it, it is 44, but now I think it, they have gone up to 66 or 68 case. And uh, that holds a good promise because it's... Uh, double stent structure. The mitral valve actually when the LV contracts, it's a churning movement, just like towel when we squeeze it. So the outer structure actually holds, whereas the inner structure which has the real valve sits in place and that allows actually a good position of the valve. The only problem is uh, 
you are doing it transapical and you have a good position, you can retrieve it any time and reposition yes. it. But when you go through the transeptal, that may not be the case because you are first deploying the the LV thing. Yeah, I'm, the sure, I'm sure Medtronic people are coming up, coming up even with the transeptal variety of the intrapid well. The yeah. other advantage of intrapid is that it catches the leaflets, so paraprosthetic leaks are off. That is what, double stent. I think, uh, thank you, Dr. Safal. Odd after such an exotic discussion on on percutaneous aortic valves, on percutaneous uh, mitral valves, and a little glimpse on percutaneous tricuspid valves to have come back to PCI. Well, we all know that the coronary angiogram is at best a luminogram, and it all depends on where you're seeing it. And when you see it, you have issues about seeing, as Vijay said, a three-dimensional structure in two dimensions, and you may actually have concealment of severe disease by diffuse involvement. So it's a, lumin it's a luminogram, it's foreshortened, it's a shadow graph, the planar projections of contrastful lumen and does not image the vessel itself. So when we approach a patient, what are the questions facing us? Is this lesion producing ischemia? Is the lesion responsible for the symptoms? Do I have to treat this lesion? How should I perform this angioplasty? Is the result of the angioplasty that I have done appropriate? Should I have used something else to modify the plaque? Is this patient still at high risk for future events? And we know that coronary angiography is not sufficient. We have tools. We have tools either by FFR, IFR, which are diagnostic, which at least for intermediate lesions help us. And they also, post-PCI, could talk a little bit about side branch stenosis and occasionally about prognosis. But imaging the wall helps us in identifying disease severity, helps us in picking up the culprit lesion, the lesion morphology, helps us to choose the device, size the stent, look for thrombus, and look also for safety of the procedure that we have done in terms of looking at malapposition, expansion, edge dissection, tissue prolapse. And if this angioplasty fails, it helps us elucidate the mechanism of stent failure. So with all these, uh, or with all these modalities which are available, what is the differences between the intravascular ultrasound and uh, using the uh, OCT? Well, the wavelengths are different. Uh, the actual resolutions uh, you have an actual resolution of 100 micron with an IVIS and an actual resolution of about 15 with an OCD, a lateral resolution of about 200 micron with an IVIS and, and a lesser uh, with an OCD. Uh, furthermore, if we actually separate what, what modality is used for what purpose in imaging, we can actually see that these modalities can be more complementary than actually perfect. And Today, intravascular imaging guidance is like an unrequited romance for most cardiologists because whatever we may do by planning, interpreting these lesions or online mapping of complex interventions, the truth is that we can, we, for most interventional cardiologists, the images are still difficult to interpret, leading to insecurity in using the information and using it correctly. The, there are a lot of guidelines which say that you, you should use it. Let's look at pre-PCI assessment. When we do an uh, intravascular ultrasound, we actually look at the intimomedial plaque by, by, by an intravascular ultrasound, and which brings us to seeing how we can define the various uh, uh, measurements in, by using an intravascular ultrasound. We can use, uh, we can clearly define what is the external elastic lamina, and we look at how much of intermedial plaque is based there. We can also characterize the plaque, which was used a lot about 10 years, 15 years ago by, by um, virtual histology was created, but we know the differences between a fibrofatty, a fibrous, or a calcific plaque, or a plaque with signal attenuation, or a plaque with a low echoic zone. 
And if you look at uh, OCT, again the same thing, we, we, can, we can put it to optimal sizing, we can select treatment, look for calcium identification, look for lipid-rich cores, look for angiographic ambiguity, and then in, we, to improve patient outcomes, we also see what all we need to know. A calcification very clearly is defined a lot by intravascular ultrasound, but the depth of the calcium can never be completely defined by intravascular ultrasound, and OCT may be better because it allows us to prepare the lesion better. Sometimes, in an ACS situation, we may see something like this, which is actually a plaque rupture, which can be confirmed better on an OCT, or a calcified nodule, which again is about 5% of ACS are going to be caused because of a calcific nodule, but again, this can be seen better by an OCT. If using just a haziness in the mid-LED, can be identified by, as a muscle bridge by very experienced operators, but to really define it, we find that inside the muscle bridge, there may be no plaque at all, and this is something we need to do. Even in vasospasm, it is now known that even in vasospasm, there would be some problems in the vessel wall, but we need to be able to define that carefully. We also look for things like spontaneous dissection, so we identify simple rules of angioplasty, deploy a stent from 50% plaque, less than 50% plaque burden to less than 50% plaque burden. Uh, we, we choose an optimal length, uh, stent length and diameter, and we can guide it by, by either of the imaging modalities, especially in long diffuse disease. In long diffuse disease, we again need to be careful as to how long do you want to deploy stents? Do you want to come right till the end of the vessel? And imaging really does not in work by intention to treat. Sometimes you have to learn as you go on because as you create problems, you understand where you have created a dissection. If you have uh, instant restenosis, looking at the pattern of restenosis, whether it is an interval proliferation, whether it is a homogeneous or a heterogeneous pattern, or a new atherosclerosis, you may have a different attempt at treating the patient differently. So there, there, there is a problem about about a glossary of terms, and, and really, if you look at it, there is a multi-laboratory inter-institute reproducibility of OCT and IVUS, which is causing a lot of problems, and this has led to a lot of different measurements being taken. So like I said, the plaque is intermomedial. We need to identify the external elastic membrane, and we need to identify the, the lumen. And thereafter, we may need to make some diameters. And how do we approach it? We can get increasingly aggressive. For example, we can use the largest reference lumen, whether proximal or distal, to be the size of the vessel. But as we get more, we can come to mid-wall, or we can come media to media. But when we come media to media, we should typically discount it by about 0.5 millimeter in choosing a size. The impact for this is, is greater in smaller vessels. And this can, IVUS utilization can predict early DES thrombosis and restenosis. We should also look after a, a, a deployment of a stent for malapposition, for expansion, and especially for edge dissections. This slide is very important for those who regularly perform intravascular ultrasound because it tells you that when you are using a 2.5 millimeter stent, you should target achieving a 4.9 millimeter square surface area. If you're using a three millimeter stent, you should target using a 7.1 millimeter square surface area. And if you're using a 3.5, it becomes almost 10. And if you're using a 4.0, it becomes almost 13. So this is to be kept in everybody's mind. There can be some residual issues following a stent, and we can just rush through. It can be edge dissection, residual plaque burden, calcific plaque, incomplete expansion, incomplete apposition, thrombus, plaque protrusion, and a problem which came much with a, about half a generation ago with some of these stents which had a failed connectors by causing a lot of stent deformation. We must realize that the stents have gone from 150 microns to now sub-70 micron strut thickness. So the, in the geometry of, and the architecture of the stents, they need to be strong enough to be able to resist stent deformation, and this has become an issue. Again, how much of malapposition is, is to be rectified and how much can be, can be actually uh, linked to MACE is something that we need to understand better. It is very clear that IVUS guided PCR is superior to angiographic guided PCR regarding MACE and even in complex lesions, especially with new generation. And there is a lot of reasons for using uh, um, uh, IVUS because we can have resorted to using a larger size of stent balloon, higher pressure, longer stents, and more post dilatation. So, um, what about OCT? Well, I, 
Personally, we have not done too much of OCT, but in the diagnostic phase, it can be used for coronary atherosclerosis severity assessment, atherosclerotic plaque characterization, plaque interpretation, and again, uh, the treatment strategy optimization, the procedural result confirmation or optimization. And, and there are various trials which have been held, the, the, the CLEOPI uh, registry, the Illumin 1, the doctors, Optax, and now the Illumin 3. But, and, and this is something which we can look at all these photographs. It helps us distinguish between red thrombus and white thrombus, between plaque rupture, plaque erosion, uh, calcified nodule. We can look for cholesterol, crystal, spotty calcium, and, and identify our, our, our subsets better. So I'm going to actually stop here because the time is short, and, and every uh, um, we can also look for some amount of malapposition, create a malapposition index, look for dissection, plaque prolapse. We can look for uh, uh, intramural hematomas, and, and all this helps us in understanding our, our, our disease better and our treatment thereof uh, really better. So if, uh, Rajneesh said, I could show one case. So if, if, I, if I get away from here, I'll actually show a case which is not truly Okay, this is actually a case where we use the same technology but in a different manner. And this is a patient who had a type B aortic dissection. This is not a coronary case. So here uh, we, we had a bit of a challenge. It was almost a pan aortic dissection starting from uh, the left subclavian. But if you can see the gap between the left subclavian, uh, the, the left carotid and the nominate was rather limited. And if you uh, would like to just scan through this, this CT, you'll find that the, the gaps uh, from the dissection were limited and the dissection is almost pan-aortic and it's almost like the dissection lumen is suspended in the middle of the aorta. Can you see that? So it's a dissection lumen is suspended in the middle of the aorta. We identified what all was coming from the true and what all was coming from the, fire, from the, from the false lumen and decided that since we did not want to jeopardize by doing just a plain uh, uh, um, stent graft, we do a hybrid procedure. So we did an aortocoronary bicarotid uh, um, uh, graft by the surgeons and a, a carotid subclavian uh, graft as well. Uh, the funny part is that when the this left subclavian graft was being deployed, I got a call that the patient is repeatedly having ventricular fibrillation. Actually, what I realized was that they were doing cautery near the stellate ganglion, and that is why this happened. Anyway, then we had to take this patient who had a dissection coming almost into the femoral artery. And you can see that this is a Doppler-guided puncture so that we enter the true lumen. Once we entered the true lumen, we had a, a big problem because uh, the patient, we kept going into the false lumen inside the aorta. So after some manipulation, we entered the true lumen and this is how we identify the true lumen by actually taking pictures that, that we, we are actually coming or all the way down and this is the left subclavian and then we, we actually checked that even the, um, uh, you can see here, the various branches as had been defined on CT, which were true and false were identified. But there was still a little doubt. And so we, we actually had the occasion to use a 10 megahertz intravascular ultrasound catheter. You can see here that the left renal is coming from, from the, uh, the true, the, the superior mesenteric is coming from the true. We had done most of the identification, but then what we did, was this guide catheter which we, we placed it right there. We took another wire and entered and we performed an intravascular ultrasound of starting from the ascending iota. And this is a very interesting graphic because you'll find that almost the identity, you can see the dissection uh, about to begin. And you can see as we go further that, that the similar CT image as you found uh, here, here you can see this is what is pulsating is the true lumen, outside is the false lumen, and, and we could see that right through we were in the true lumen. If you can make this out, this is, this is entirely uh, the, the true lumen which is coming all the way down. We, we actually had the chance to check each individual vessel which was arising from the true lumen. We confirmed that we were not going to place a stent graft in the false lumen. So once, once we had done this, we, it added to our, our procedural confidence and we went ahead and uh, uh, the rest is, of course, pretty standard. We, we checked that the surgical grafts were okay, and we went ahead and placed our end graft, uh, and uh, uh, this is what the results look like. Mm, this is, of course, all the measurements. This is the stent graft coming in. And this is a pictelliotogram after the stent graft has been deployed. But now you can see something funny has happened. The surgeons were requested 
to not just ligate, but to ligate and divide the innominate. But they were kind because they only ligated the innominate. They did not divide it, thinking that they may do some harm. So anyway, we went back and uh, uh, we went through the right radial and put a couple of coils uh, so as to make sure that there would be no endoleak from, from this side. Anyway, having done that, uh, the, the patient, we also checked the, the left uh, uh, subclavian because we wanted to check the left subclavian carotid connection and we found that it was all right. So this is of course the, the, the check CT which uh, revealed a, a fairly deployed uh, stent graft in the, uh, in the proximal DTA and the patient is now, this is about eight months and the patient is doing reasonably well. He just got awarded the best teacher award in Orissa. So I'm sorry, I, I, just, I just took a little aside to show something different because most of the other talk was pretty mundane and, uh, and uh, standard. Thank you very much.